let's get the elephant in the room out of the way first. You can't beat Helldivers 2. So long as the battle to defend managed democracy rages on, the job of a Helldiver is never done. Alright, alright, I'm not convincing anyone with that. There might be some degree of traitorous intent as I've attempted to create an arbitrary success condition for Helldiver challenge runs. Challenge runs that might involve some less than optimal stipulations that could slightly hinder the war effort. Forgive me though, as we'll be undertaking these hardships for the greater good of Super Earth, as we intend to humiliate bot and bug kind alike by taking the fight to them with just a fraction of the power the Super Earth armed forces actually wield. The goal? To successfully complete a full three mission Helldive difficulty campaign versus Automaton and Terminated Combatants. Failure on any of the three missions that make up a single campaign will lead to the termination of that attempt, requiring a reset from the beginning on a brand new planet. To make things even harder, as we want to send a message, a suicide mission will simply not be considered good enough. At least one Helldiver has to make a successful extraction from the dive via Pelican 1 for the mission to be considered complete, meaning we can't just throw ourselves mindlessly at the initial objectives. However, once either a bug or bot campaign is successfully finished in its entirety, that progress will be locked in, even if we fail taking out the other faction. These will likely remain as standard rules for any future challenges, although if the war expands and we find ourselves battling on more fronts in the future, their campaigns will also be included in expanded runs. For now though, we just face down the initial threats with a pretty serious mandated limitation. We cannot fire a shot. Now, when my crew and I first received these orders, we assumed, as one would expect, that no shooting would be an easy stipulation to track. But as you'll soon find out, the statisticians over at Super Earth have a pretty loose idea of what constitutes shots fired. The rules, as they were initially drawn out, were as follows. No firing any weapon in a Helldiver's primary, secondary or tertiary slot. Whether a laser beam, flamethrower or rocket launcher, using them at all counted as firing as far as we were concerned. This meant, alongside losing access to every standard weapon in our loadout arsenal, we also lost access to a huge range of some of the best stratagems in the game, the full list of which you're seeing on screen now. Of course, it wasn't going to be as simple as just losing those though, but more on that later. So, with only our throwable grenades, a handful of viable stratagems, and of course our bare fists, my initial crew, embark on the toughest Helldive yet, as we strive to find out if you can beat Helldivers 2 without shooting. Cruising over the automaton planet of Dropnir, our initial plan is to take on the shorter eradication mission first as it likely has the lowest odds of success, but also the smallest sunk cost for attempting. It really would be fair to say that we didn't have a cohesive strategy at this stage, everyone was tunneling on their own plans. Since we could use the guard dog rover as a form of close range DPS, it was pretty clear they'd be worth bringing for most kill focused missions. But outside of those, we were really experimenting with everything, ranging from the explosive and EMS mortar combo to hold the bots still whilst blowing them up from afar, as well as stratagems like the Tesla Tower, which can rack up some serious kill figures if you can protect it. And surprisingly, our complete lack of cohesion led to a mad first couple of minutes as we were pushed back outside the walls of the compound after picking up the first 100 kills. I carried stun grenades to help keep the hulks at bay, but very quickly we found ourselves surrounded as I emphatically went down for the first death of the run, losing every appendage I once had to none other than my ally's Sea Dog's grenade. I wouldn't have it any other way. Shortly after, we were already in serious trouble, losing 50% of our reinforcement budget way off the pace. However, as I spotted the box, partaking in an act of friendly fire of their own, I had a bit of an epiphany. What if I fled the combat zone long enough for the traitor barrage to be called in? only to martyr myself amongst as many bots as possible whilst the Super Destroyer turned us all into ash. The moment of madness turned out to be a stroke of brilliance, as we added another 100 kills to our total without needing to call in any of our own resources. I proved myself an idiot savant just a minute later as I lost a 1v1 melee battle with a shield devastator, but by this point the damage was already done. We'd somehow destroyed 500 automatons in less than 8 minutes and extraction was available. Whilst I never had a hope of making it aboard the shuttle alive personally, the crew bought enough time for a lone sea dog, no not that one, to escape, returning to the ombudsman of family values as we checked that indeed not a shot was fired. I won't lie, I wasn't expecting this success and the power of the traitor cannon was definitely not something I was counting on when planning this challenge, but we'll absolutely take that information with us moving forwards. Hopefully we won't need to attempt another bot eradication though as we prepare for the next extended mission drop. 
It's worth pointing out that we're all running armor with the med kit passive here. We did consider going for more of a grenade focus, but this is pretty much guaranteed that we will go down from time to time with no way to really defend ourselves. Having the extended healing duration and stim capacity slightly reduces the rate at which we blast through that all-important reinforcement budget. Anyway, diving into a command bunker mission next, our plans changed slightly as long-range stationary unit destruction became their main objective. A couple of us switched over to 380mm orbital and eagle strikes, which whilst very inconsistent, can be absolutely brilliant as fire and forget bunker destroyers. This is exactly how it played out, as the orbitals made a mockery out of the first two command centers after we essentially speed ran their destruction with a few lucky strikes. I even had time to embark on a solo mission against the Fabricators before being forcefully reunited with my team. With all three of the main objectives down in the first five minutes of the dive, we even managed a side objective at the mortar encampment, which I escaped from almost unscathed, learning how to teleport in the process of whacking my head up against a rock. I've never seen a game with as many good bugs as Helldivers has, and I don't mean the Terminates. Anyway, after four minutes of training the bots around the escape zone, as we did unfortunately roll into the complex stratagem plotting modifier, which doubles call-in time even for Pelican 1, we made it out with a full squad for a very easy clear, even coming out on top of a few melee 1v1s. Brilliant! Already on to the final... why does that say I fired 36 shots? <sighs> okay, so here's the problem. For some reason, certain stratagems that obviously don't need to be shot in the traditional sense are counted as shots fired by Supreme Command. Honestly, I have no idea how to rule this one. At the time, as it was deemed to be in the spirit of the run, we just carried on. But don't worry, the Super Earth government wasn't going to let the bot campaign be completed as disgracefully as this, because on the next dive we faced down with the dreaded civilian escort objective that was a bridge too far for the squad stalling us for the best part of 15 minutes as we stuffed all 30 civs into the shuttle bay whilst relying on our final resetting reinforce, but eventually being overwhelmed and going down on the mission. With a bit of testing courtesy of my teammates, we did eventually discover which stratagems were tracked as shots fired by the game. Basically, if it aims its damage automatically, as is the case for the orbital laser or rail cannon for example, it won't be counted, but if you have to aim it independently, even if it's a barrage with random variants, it will be considered as firing. That means a pretty massive portion of our original arsenal is now also gone. So it's no longer a no-shooting run, it's also a without half of the most useful stratagems run. In any case, that isn't even what lost us our next attempt, heading over to do combat on the infamous Malevolent Creek. Whilst we managed to destroy all seven of the active fabricators, required for exfiltration relatively comfortably, finishing the last one off personally with a well-aimed frag, this attempt was failed at the hands of a Sea Dog slip-up, firing a shot right as she tried to ping the map, but being knocked out of the menu by a stray bullet. It's unlucky, but certainly an avoidable mistake we're going to need to cut out of our gameplay if we're going to have a chance at this one. Heading back in for an eradication attempt, this one went less smoothly than our first mission of the run, finding ourselves essentially hellpod camped from the start of the dive. I found a tiny bit of respite by scaling my way down the side of this wall, grouping a ton of bots up before another Sea Dog grenade sent me spiralling down to my inevitable demise at the hands of the traitor rockets, which hit me instantly this time, getting spoiled kill once more by my teammates' minds upon my return, which should probably be another stratagem crossed off all of our lists. Little Guy G lived for far longer than he should have been able to, but despite Nico also gaining that famed teleportation power, he wasn't long for this world upon his return, leaving us with the disgraceful conduct appraisal for the first time on this run. The next attempt didn't go much better, as after testing out the ballistic shield, shall we say unsuccessfully, it was Nico who fired an unintentional bullet this time, getting baited into thinking he could left click safely by his own dormant stratagem call in. It's probably worth noting that we hadn't actually created the new planet after every failure rule at this point, as it was clear that my stream chat wanted us to somehow conquer the dreaded Malevolent Creek, so apologies for the constant rainforest setting. But it didn't really matter, as we weren't around long for the next geological survey mission before, once again, poor communication led to two of the troops calling in a probe simultaneously, which as we know always ends in tears, as once again, Sea Dog fired a rogue bullet. Don't worry, we eventually work out a strategy to avoid this, so it isn't all misclicks resetting our promising attempts. We found other great ways to ruin runs, although on attempt 6, things started out brilliantly. Nico somehow ended up landing headfirst out of his pod before showing off his diver's impressive splits just a moment after leaving the crew. Apparently this can happen when you crash mid-dive, which is absolutely hilarious. I didn't enjoy another friendly fire frag at my feet though, this was a classic watch out Noli moment where I was given all of one second to work out what it was I needed to watch out for before my giblets were raining down from the sky. Honestly, 
I don't think there's such a thing as an unfunny death in this game, as my second Helldiver met a similarly brutal end by flipping over a wall. The rest of the run was made trivial by the power of the orbital laser, which really goes to town on those bot objectives, giving us a whole host of reinforcers to play around with on the escape. With all that leeway, I attempted a tender moment with my crewmate, which was rudely interrupted and will not be forgotten soon. In fact, I was left even more miserable when we arrived at the results screen to see that I had indeed fired three shots. It's hard to believe, but this was caused by none other than the orbital smoke strike, which indeed, according to Bloody Joel, does counter shots fired and can even be missed somehow, so even more reason to avoid that almost useless stratagem. We also didn't get far into the next attempt as about a minute in, Nico fired another rogue bullet, falling foul of the same stratagem holding issue that had caused problems earlier in the run. Honestly, this left morale pretty low. So much so we decided the automatons could wait, instead switching our focus towards the Terminids, who were at least also playing with a similar rule set, not being able to shoot themselves. Heading to Crimsica, I love me a bit of bug genocide, and finally the Tesla Tower could show its true potential, comboing me all the way up to a successive 76 kill streak as we tore through the initial waves of hunters. Bile Titans were laser fodder when we started crossing beams, and our traitorous techniques did the rest. I did inexplicably spontaneously combust right before the escape, but we had enough reinforcements to land straight in on the Pelican and get out before any more mine-related disasters occurred. Mission 2 took us on another geological survey. I can think of no better course to die for than a little bit of ore vein probing. I'm not sure Sea Dog thought the same when she decided to line the entire area with incendiary mines though. I'm not saying she's a super earth traitor, but if a court martial were to occur, I know which side of that courtroom I'd be sitting on. Anyway, I basically tossed myself at this first probe until it was finished, dropping a few lives to force it through. In hindsight, I'm not sure this was a worthwhile trade-off when we couldn't keep up the pace on probe 2, as a Bile Titan corpse was completely blocking its screen. This slowed down our progress until I took matters into my own hands and just man-moded a legion of terminated warriors with the butt of my gun to keep them off the rest of my crew. I seriously had no idea just how powerful melee can be in this game. At the final objective, the prospecting drill, the situation got a lot more dire though, as stalkers found us. We foolishly tried to brute force our way through, which just doesn't work out when stalkers are as powerful as they are, making the whole process of leading Bile Titans and Chargers around that much harder, as they're just too fast and persistent. But if you want any evidence of why the Stim Armor is OP, look no further than this clip. It's basically the only way to outrun stalkers with its repeat stamina resetting prowess, as little guy G showcased impeccably. Alas, you can never outrun stalkers in the end, as they caught up to him, calling me back in for the final life, which I duly spent the majority of being tossed like a damn salad. In the future, focusing down stalker nests is going to have to be a top priority. Licking our wounds over on a Starnu for another genocide run, these are some of the easiest format missions in the entire challenge. The rovers and Tesla towers do most of the heavy lifting, when the only thing we need to worry about is keeping enough distance between us and the bots. A lesson I briefly forgot when I meleeed this tiny little bile spitter, who apparently has enough go inside to one-shot a moderately armoured Helldiver. It wasn't long before we'd racked up 500 kills again though, and whilst this bile titan managed to block my escape at first, we had reinforcers to play around with, securing a well-fought mission victory. Alas, the stress of no shooting was too much for little guy G, who will be bowing out of the group for the rest of this run. His attempted heroics on Crimsica will not be forgotten, retiring back to Super Earth as the only player, other than myself, yet to accidentally fire his gun, although I'm not sure how long I'll be keeping to that. Anyway, whilst we recruit another fourth later down the line, the three of us who remain behind still believe we had enough to see the Sistanu campaign through. The mission was data retrieval, which isn't that difficult, but in a moment of madness, I tried out the precision strike, just to test if other orbitals counted as shooting. Whilst this thing was effectively impossible to aim with the complex stratagem plotting modifier, arriving in 3-5 to five business days, it still counted as shooting as far as the game was concerned. I wasn't to know at the time, so we forged onwards, with the mission starting promisingly before I imploded at the hands of a Starnu plant life. Honestly, these shrubs are dangerous. On the final objective, the lighting was so intense I couldn't even make out the finger DDR pattern, wasting another of our last few reinforcers. Remember, by losing a Helldiver, five reinforcers went with them, an impactful blow to the run. Frustrated and in a hurry, I eventually popped the light, input the final code, and began the march over to extraction. We trained the bugs all around the rocks with relative ease, as we also learned that Bile Titans are like moths to the flame when you drop Tesla Towers in their vicinity, distracting the major threats long enough for Pelican 1 to arrive and absolutely cook me with its jet boosters on the landing. Not ideal, but at least the Dwarg made it out alive. 
Sadly, regardless of our success on the mission, I fired five shots, obviously landing only one of them, as the precision strike kind of sucks. At least we were learning though, as it was at this stage I started to fathom specifically what was considered shooting and what wasn't. We worked out that mortars were fair game, as was the orbital rail cannon and laser, making them pretty much staples on everyone's loadouts, alongside some sort of either aggressive or defensive backpack. Taking the fight to 4 Prime next, despite a bit of classic friendly fire, we made it through the first communication uplink sequence, again working towards the dreaded Civ Xfil objective. This majestic Bile Titan made my day by just chilling out on a rock, completely unbothered, moisturised, happy, in his lane, focused and flourishing as he basically let the entire squad wander past, with only a token Bile Spew to keep us honest. Once again we found ourselves kiting around the shuttle bay objective for the best part of 15 minutes, until I found that lying down and playing dead was the real key. That was before I was distracted by this charger climbing up a damn building for long enough that a Bile Titan clipped me from afar. Sadly, with two minutes on the timer by the time I returned to the fight and half a dozen Bile Titans surrounding me, there was little I could do other than to try facing my fate head on, hoping for a bit of bug friendly fire that never came, and instead melting into a pile of goo. Three player, no shooting hell dive was simply different gravy, but at least we'd solved that problem of accidental shooting, heading into Hellmire for a comparatively trivial eradication attempt, using the geometry to really mess with the bug's tracking abilities. By switching over to laser weaponry, we'd learn that accidental shots could be avoided, as these things take half a second to spin up, giving us every chance of sticking to the rule set without failing arbitrarily, just about dodging certain impalement on my way out of this successful run. The Purging Hatcheries mission should have been a walk in the park when we drew up this challenge, as one well-aimed hellbomb can do most of the job on its own, but sadly, that counts as shooting, so instead, we had to throw ourselves at the egg clusters over and over again, using what grenade supplies we had to do the work for us. To say we were playing on tilt would be an understatement, although I don't know if any of the Helldivers out there have experienced this, but the zero reinforcement buff is a real phenomenon, as we finally locked in when we realised we had no more second chances. After landing back in, I blew up the final few unborn terminids of Hatchery 2 before making my way over to the final nest, again popping the eggs with a couple of satisfying impact frag tosses. Sadly, even with only a two minute escape call in, we just didn't have the room for any more mistakes, which were bound to happen by the time the Xfil landing was surrounded, falling once more less than a minute from a mission to victory. At least now we know to avoid eggs, as well as civilian Xfils wherever possible. After one more quickfire failure on 4E Prime, we could head back to Hellmire, which undoubtedly has the easier modifiers for us to deal with on this run. At this stage, genocide is our speciality, as turrets do so much of the job for us, clearing this one in under 6 minutes, a new record at this stage. Geological surveys had been our kryptonite before, and once more we spent the first few minutes running rings around the local bug life. The adaptation we'd made by bringing at least one shield generator for focusing down objectives was massive, and kept our reinforcement supply in much healthier shape than usual by the time we needed to escape. The only time the shield couldn't save me was when completely surrounded, which is normally just a result of poor positioning, something I've definitely worked on over the course of this run as a result of the no shooting limitation. Despite a massive misplay by me, after this hunter managed a get down Mr. President dive, catching my impact grenade about half a meter from my face, my squad carried me to victory, escaping as a full team for the first time in a while. Two down, one to go. Time for an oil extraction. The true Helldiver experience in the current resource war. I mean, uh, the battle for democracy. These can be nightmarish experiences, as the initial pump activation requirement is one of the most demanding team-focused objectives in the game, with the dreaded pipe puzzle baiting us into wasting the first 15 of our Helldivers' lives. Now with zero reinforcers remaining, the squad entered the zone. At least, the other two did. I managed to blow myself up with an impact grenade for about the fifth time on this challenge. The heroism displayed by Nico was commendable though, living for a record 20 minutes and training even stalkers around Hellmire to keep our dreams of completion alive, while Sea Dog and I just charged down the objectives in an attempt to force through the escape. Just look at this though, it has to be one of the most confusing pump transfer minigame setups I've ever seen, which we eventually solved when Sea Dog lay down her life once more for the cause. In a moment of madness, as I attempted to shake a stalker off my tail, sprinting to make the final oil transfer, I threw another frag, expecting it to create some distance, but excruciatingly rolling my ragdolling body straight over another nade thrown by Nico, wasting my life at a crucial juncture. With the stalker nest still pumping them out by the minute, we didn't have the resources left to push through another transfer, failing to even complete the objective, let alone escape the mission. Another brutal loss on the half of the campaign we expected to be easier overall. In response, 
we went back to high command and recruited a new fourth diver, Echo, who whilst only a level 14 sergeant, not yet trusted with some of the key stratagems in this battle, had one advantage over our more veteran hell divers. He didn't know fear, which was perfect for forcing through objective completion, regardless of the cost. Orbiting back over Crimsica, the very first thing my Tesla tower did was target down an explosive barrel, removing my limbs emphatically. These things might go wild for the kill count, but their friendly fire potential is also impeccable. This planet's flat layout makes it a lot more dangerous, but it's also much easier to grind through bug kite in rapidly, with them all spawning out in an open plane, leading to yet another easy genocide clear. Whilst our dedication to the Helldiver cause could be questioned by this gameplay, it is worth mentioning we still managed to vaporize our fair share of bugs and bots so far in the run. An ICBM launch was up next, heading straight in on my own to grab the launch codes and start moving towards the fuel pumps, with half the squad splitting up to clear the power generator objective at the same time. 24 reinforcers with a full team and the increased reinforcement budget made our margin for error that much wider, but we hardly needed them early into this mission, speedrunning the fuel requirements and heading directly over to the rocket launch pad. Nuke launched, I decided to try launching my own personal nuke with a swift melee strike, which went about as well as you can expect, but with all the leeway we had available, this was really just a speedrun strat, allowing me to land right on the exfil to join the crew in repelling the oncoming march of the titans. Hell, we even escaped with super samples in our pockets, a sign of just how far we'd come across the duration of this run, dinging the big level 50 in the process. I can't imagine becoming a school captain in a more fitting way. Once more though, celebrations could wait for later. This was potentially it, one data retrieval away from completing the terminated portion of the run. Diving in, the strategy stayed much the same. I bought a shield to focus down objectives, a laser for titan destruction, the auto-aiming 110mm rocket pods, predominantly for charger takedowns, which also didn't count as shooting, and the Tesla tower as a bit of backup and distraction on the field. Things started perfectly, as we immediately sniffed out a stalker nest, removing one of the most run-ending obstacles early on. I slalom through bug debris to complete the primary objective at the power generator, but a second wave of stalkers pushed us away. Fortunately, we had enough lives to make it over and collect the hard drive, escorting Sea Dog over to the comms relay and taking out any bug patrols we happen upon with ruthless efficiency. We've learned over dozens of failures that it's the unexpected breaches that tend to overwhelm us, so dealing with the bug menace in its entirety wherever possible is absolutely key. All this experience led us to the relay, although we weren't out the woods yet, as in leaping from the upper rail to deliver the SSSD, Sea Dog dropped it in the water causing it to sink under the surface, never to be seen again. This was crushing, requiring us to reset back to the last objective with just a handful of lives remaining. This time, I took responsibility for the SSSD as I ran it directly to the terminal, raising the satellite and sprinting for the escape, down to only the resetting reinforcement charge. We finally located the second stalker nest on the way over, dealing with that for what we hoped would be an easy exfil. But it truly wasn't to be as the whole crew was pancaked right by the exit of the most bile spewer infested planet I've ever seen. I mean, all of this was moot, as I might have finally fired my first shot as I forgot to switch off the revolver after carrying the SSSD and running into that same annoying situation where you think you have a strategy marker in your hand. But we don't even need to talk about that, because the whole team failed, right? Like, it's not my fault for killing morale by letting them know that it was all for naught anyway, Okay, that one was on me, but we were still in the zone for another clean run, as it was obviously possible from how close we were consistently getting. Back on the arid hellmire, sealing bug holes is even easier than committing genocide, and despite an incredibly viscera-filled escape, at least a couple of the crewmates made it on board, whilst I was left to party with the bugs on the ground. The beauty of this campaign we'd found on hellmire was that it consisted of two shorter missions, meaning we also had a genocide to crush. Big thank you to my diver in crime Nico for providing his perspective of this mission as we did run into a little blip in the recording, although at this point, bug eradication missions are as easy as it comes, once again clearing it with time and Helldiver lives to spare. Once more, the final mission was a geological survey, the objective type that seemed to punish the no shooting rule set the most, with its 19 plus monitor interactions making bug kiting a necessity. With me finally going back to the trusty stun grenades, this was easier than it had been previously, with half the squad staying away from the objective to pull aggro away from me at the probe. After reaching the second ore vein, we obliterated this titan, but still couldn't make room to interact with the martyr. Eventually, I had to make the play, covering my entrance with a 110 strike and pushing to the prospecting drill objective. The fire tornadoes did their best to clear me off it, but with our last few squad lasers, I was able to keep things moving along, acquiring the data and immediately rushing to the exit with nine reinforcers in our back pockets. 
I even received an inexplicable rocket boost launching me towards the exit. Honestly, I have no idea what sent me flying like that, but I'm just happy to still be here, you know? With that adrenaline coursing through my veins, I had the fire in me to reach the extraction first, prepping for the final two minutes of the campaign. Within that short space of time, things got a little crazy as Bile Titans closed in on us with no more firepower to really clear the zone. At the last moment, Pelican 1 arrived, but with the Titans still phasing through the ground, the dreaded no takeoff glitch occurred. No matter what we did, despite having all four Helldivers aboard, Pelican 1 refused to fly, leading to a sad Black Hawk Down style final stand as the walls of the shuttle were eventually bridged and the whole squad abandoned to the Hellmire dust. This was crushing. So crushing that we were left to consider the entire purpose of our orders. Could we really be blamed for that failure? Were we set up? Should we give up? No, those thoughts amount to treason. Logic tells me it must have been the bot schemes that prevented our escape. If we deal with them first, surely victory against the bugs will follow soon after. So once again we return to the Severin Sector, to the battle for the creek. Bot eradications really are a different level of challenge though, and back to just the core three who'd been on this crazy journey from the beginning, we just didn't have the firepower or resources to break that lofty 500 mark this time around. Getting in deep with the Super Earth authorities only got us so far with fewer resources than we'd become accustomed to. The highlight of this one has to be managing to go on a reverse hell dive after landing in alongside Nico as we were flung across the entire map by a tank's engine combusting. Whilst he lost his head in a tree, I somehow managed to lift this one initially by landing in some shallow water, although the authorities didn't look kindly upon this dishonour after my recent outside the map excursions, executing me almost immediately. I did find a moment sanctuary atop this massive rock, but all refuges are temporary once you have a traitor amongst your ranks, as the volleys of orbital fire eventually launch me into the next space here, surrounded by the boys. I met a similar fate landing back in one last time, barely touching the ground before racking more doomed air miles, finally failing the campaign. That was the definition of out of the frying pan into the fire, sending us reeling back to Ubenir for a blitz search and destroy, aiming to tackle more open mission types rather than claustrophobic eradications. This might be my worst ever hell dive landing, dropping myself almost directly on a contact mine placed just behind my hell pod. After landing back in, instead of dealing with the bot drops, I just sprinted north, calling in the first orbital laser on a heavy outpost to complete over half of the destruction. Sadly, approaching this secondary artillery encampment wasn't quite so easy, with MG Raiders managing to do their jobs for once. It was fine though, as when you all go down together, the game decides where to drop the next wave of hell pods, allowing us to immediately breach their defences from above. We really stumbled at the final fabricator, just throwing ourselves at it repeatedly until I landed on the bot cannon, using up our final reinforcers in the process. Sea Dog was then bullied into a casket by a set of ground spores, leading to another clutch stealth play by Nico. To be honest, this is why I avoided making this a solo challenge, as stealth, especially against bots, is a little overpowered, and when you squad up, someone's bound to slip up and start a few crazy gunfights, which if we're being honest is what Helldivers is all about. Speaking of slip-ups, upon landing back in I attempted to distract the incoming forces, taking their attention away from the extraction zone, but the Hulk Bruiser managed to absolutely decimate me from around cover, leaving Nico alone once more to receive the friendliest love tap from a tank I've ever seen, which was apparently fatal. Trying a sandy planet this time, whose totu was the destination, although knowing we had to evacuate civs and survive an eradication mission to complete this campaign, we didn't head in high on confidence. Finally, it was me team killing with grenades, getting a little accidental revenge after all this time, but this was hardly conducive to actually completing the mission. After falling off the more defensible elevated section of the map, we were left with over 150 kills still to pick up thanks to some classic traitor strats, but only a couple of lives to do it with. So, we knew it was all over when I found myself embarrassingly impaled on the barrel of a tank. This campaign was always high risk though, so as we flew back to Malevolen Creek, we still had some shreds of confidence remaining. Again, with the AA defenses modifier active, our execution had to be perfect at this stage, running very lean stratagem builds with only the necessary lasers and dog drones across all of our loadouts. Search and destroy up first, this gameplay is the visual representation of the phrase, speak softly and carry a big stick, crawling like a snake in the grass whilst my orbital laser went to town on the automaton defenses, one of the major facets making these fabricator missions easier than say bug nest destructions. Within two minutes after throwing out three lasers, the six necessary fabricators were in tatters, and with only a two minute call in on the pelican, we were never really in any danger on this one. I was finding, against bots, with Bile Titans not being a concern, I could lean on mortars to pick up a few more long range kills, which was helpful for holding out an escape, 
as we stayed just in range of the extraction zone for long enough to be picked up. Dashing for the Xville, Nico was actually shot down by a rocket after entering the ship, as I was sent reeling underneath it and also dispatched before standing up. Sea Dog shared a similar fate, blindsided for what we feared might be the most unfortunate mission failure so far. But fortunately, with his Master of the Power Steering Ship upgrade, Nico was able to land right back down on the Pelican, climbing aboard in its last second on the ground and exfilling to save the day, whilst we were left saluting his valor, surrounded by bots. For as we know, there are no old divers on Malevolent Creek. But we can't mourn the Fallen until this sick experiment is complete, heading in for a Command Bunker Destruction mission with the exact same loadouts. Unfortunately, as Commander, I take responsibility for dropping us right in the danger zone, getting ragdolled all over the place as we landed right beside the first two bunkers. On the plus side, Orbital Lasers made short work of these things, targeting the main objectives immediately, allowing us to sprint east for the final bunker. This cannon turret failed to pick me up out in the open, as I took it down with frags to avenge my fallen allies. The final satellite station fell just the same to the heat of my laser, as I've cleared out the remaining grunts and sprinted due west to the Xville. Lying low for as long as possible until all hell broke loose, our lasers were just coming back off cooldown in time to clear the landing site, cruising to probably the cleanest mission success of the entire run, losing only four more helldivers to the creek as I went flawless for the first time in the challenge. One more mission. Fittingly, an ICBM launch. Upon landing, I was too groggy to stop this commissar from calling in a bot drop, losing the first helldiver after a hulk landed on top of me. With the others fully equipped to grab the launch codes though, I started sprinting due south, hoping to steal a march on the bots at the power gen. This plan was abruptly halted, when as far as I can tell, this plant decided to launch me violently into a rock face, wasting another life in the process. Fortunately, when the shrubbery wasn't choosing treason and fighting for the bots, we could comfortably push through this stage of the mission, heading over to the fuel pump which was sadly in range of a stratagem jammer, requiring a bit of espionage. We split up here with me heading off alone to try and push the objective forward with only a shield gen and frags for protection, successfully clearing a path inside and keeping some of the aggro away from the other two who were currently sneaking into the jamming station. With their attentions divided, I managed to push the fuel objective to stage 3, whilst the others hellbombed the jammer, allowing us to return as a squad after I went down to finish up the process, with exactly half our starting supply of reinforcements still remaining. I caught zombies my way out of there with only melee bots following us out of the jungle, losing them in the foliage as we rushed to the rocket platform. The launch was simple as I took the attention of the hulks away from the terminal and then started to push towards the escape as the nuke entered orbit. I narrowly avoided death by the dreaded sniper cannon turrets that really are some of the greatest threats to helldiver kind in existence, just about making out of their tremendous range with three lives left at the escape. Once again, lasers and mortars held the bots at bay just long enough, falling to our final reinforced right as Pelican 1 returned for the last time, flying clear of the creek and successfully completing the bot side of the no-shooting run. I mean, we could call it a day there, right? For all intents and purposes, bugs had been conquered without firing too, but something about it just didn't sit right with us. Those divers never saw the light of day after their almost successful mission, how could we claim victory whilst their ashes burned up on Hellmire? No, once more, we had to go back, back to 4E Prime, to show the bugs that all they were worth was a trio of Helldivers who never passed firearms training, ruining their day one Tesla Tower at a time. We were hardened veterans at this point, with almost perfect positioning and the support of our laser dogs to do the killing for us, and occasionally some traitor bombs. You know how these eradication missions go. Fleeing the scene was just a single death to my name and an even spread of kills across the team. Alas, there's just something about these geological survey missions that really stretch our capabilities, and with Shriekers now joining the Terminid fight since we last took them on, we have a whole new level of threat to deal with. As such, the next mission was an outright failure, with footage too brutal to even show. Yeah, I lost it. Anyway, flying back to Crimsica, this planet was better suited to be the location where we'd raise the flag of democracy, with its blood-soaked moors already claiming the lives of many of our fallen Helldivers. First up, we took on the dreaded geological survey. If things were going to go wrong, they might as well do so sooner rather than later. Within minutes, we were already facing down a hellscape of bugs and body parts at the first ore vein. However, from the experiences of the Fallen, we finally learned that the best approach is to split off and avoid focusing bug aggro in one location. I repeatedly pushed the martyr on the drill, but the swarm was just too thick to force my way through without a shield, as I eventually broke, throwing an impact grenade that first ended Nico's life, then my own, when the hunter closed the distance. We took down one of the Bile Titans who'd been causing us so many persistent issues on landing back in, as I started to take responsibility for the Horde whilst Nico ran to finish up the prospecting. I truly was dead weight on this one though, with my crewmates having to grab me by the scruff of my neck, already setting up at the extract to call in Pelican 1 the second the drill had finished. 
Somehow I survived this blunt trauma long enough to call Sea Dog back in, meaning the two of us could hold out together and escape as soon as the ship landed, blasting off in an iron storm right as Nico gave his life once more. Never before have I been more carried through a dive, but we were still only one third of the way through the campaign, and I still had plenty of opportunities to redeem myself. Or not. Bile Spewers will always be my least favourite foes. I was sort of assimilated into this Bile Titan straight out of the Hellpod, needing a well-placed grenade to eventually blast me free. But with what I'd learned inside the belly of the beast, we're easily able to kill off the last of the 500, sprinting to the escape where, unfortunately, I was turned to giblets once more, Honestly, I don't even know what got me that time. Sometimes you just turn to a torso in this game, it's just the way it goes. Rolling with the punches, with that great escape, it was finally time to end this, once and for all. An oil extraction to make amends for our past failures. We blitzed the first pump until I wandered slightly too close to my own Tesla tower, causing initial panic as our first few reinforcers were wasted. But we'd experienced these tilt landings too many times before, actually calming down and refocusing. I turned my attention to the last titan at the objective, decimating the beast with my hellpod as a missile, landing and covering the pump with Sea Dog's aid, finishing the first setup five minutes into the mission. My experience with the pipe minigame was finally paying off as I quickly moved the second pump along, smashing through the bug goo to open them up and let the fuel flow. Instead of rushing to the transfer station immediately, Nico and I shadowed Sea Dog, who made a beeline for the objective before we all joined up to fend off the oncoming wave. In a moment that can only be described as karmic super-Earth justice, the shuttle decided to break, duplicating itself and flying back to the Super Destroyer before we'd even opened up the flow of oil. I do not know why this happened, but frankly, I do not care. We were tantalizingly close earlier on Hellmire, I wasn't going to let this peculiar reprieve go to waste, saving us dozens of reinforcers for the final stand at the exfil. The platform was charged by our last orbital strikes, dealing lethal damage to the bugs in the area. With this kind of veteranship on the team, we knew we'd done something special, embracing, surrounded by the corpses of smouldering bugs. At the final moment though, another Bile Titan appeared and our hearts fell. Not just because Nico was eviscerated before our eyes, but because the Titan's rigid corpse once again stood on the ground where the Pelican was landing, likely the same event that caused our previous escape to fail. But this time, things were different. The ship took off, leaving the war-torn Crimsica in its wake, finally freeing us from the shackles of no shooting hell dives. Naturally, the mood back on the Ombudsman of Family Values was jubilant. We didn't know if we were the first to accomplish this task. How could we? There are millions of hell divers staking their lives out on the battlefields of the Galactic War, hour by hour, day by day, who could stake a claim to the same valor. Our sacrifices meant no more than anyone else's. But as a group, we truly achieved something for ourselves and for the pride of Super Earth. This might not have been the most effective way to fight for managed democracy, but it was certainly the most honourable. So, if Super Earth wants martyrs for its cause, our Desmond Dawes-esque code of honour should be sufficient. I mean, it's not like we were complete conscientious objectives. We were more than happy to kill with our hellpods, our grenades, the butts of our weapons, or hell, even the remnants of our arsenal that weren't inexplicably deemed as firing by Joel. Through it all, we learned a lot, and we'll be ready to face whatever comes next in the Galactic War with everything we've got. Thank you so much for watching. This video was a joy to produce. Let me know what you think of the format down in the comments. And of course, I'd love to hear more challenge run ideas too. No shooting is a bit of a classic here on my channel with the Payday franchise. So I had to give it a go in Helldivers and doing so with such a fantastic squad alongside me was a joy. Check out their respective links down in the description below as this simply wouldn't have been possible without them. Take care, stay tuned for more Helldivers and I'll see you soon. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.